Ah, yes. Greetings. If you're wondering what on earth is progressive economics, uh, to give the TLDR, it's bollocks. And yes, I will give a more thorough explanation than that, more than the article I have here does anyway. But before I get into that, I want to explain something here. While I do enjoy taking the mickey out the lefties, Lord knows we won't lack for material anytime soon, they are quite the special brand of lunacy, there's plenty of other channels that also do that, and arguably much better than I do. It's fun, sure, but it is merely the right's version of the feedback loop. So the overall purpose of this little channel of mine is to baptize you in the fire of the right wing. I wish to purge you of every ounce of left-wing illness that you have, most know I'm a monarchist, and while I'm not suggesting you need to take the monarchy pill, although God bless you if you do, at the very least, I wish to present arguments and rationale that will make you as morally and intellectually anarchist as I can. And by that I mean teach society as best organized through voluntarism. But before I get into the sugar-lumpy propaganda, there's two things I want to point out. One is a trap that so many people seem to fall into, which is the failure to make the distinction between leftist grievances and leftist values or solutions. The left does have some legitimate grievances, absolutely, but they have no solutions whatsoever. They have a one-size-fits-all solution for every problem, which is what makes the left a catastrophic failure in every aspect. And you can see this in action today. The road to hell is paved with leftist fantasies, but don't take my word for it. Go ask any democratic cities. Everything these people advocate for involves increasing the size, scope, and the role of government. They think every problem can be solved via the state. It is the ideology of the parasite, designed to enslave you by projecting itself as the provider state. There's a good quote by Ledin. Who is secure in all of his basic needs? Who has work, spiritual care, medical care, housing, food, occasional entertainment, free clothing, free burial, free everything? The answer might be nuns and monks, but the standard reply is prisoners. The road to hell isn't exactly littered with angelic dust now, is it? Any concession you make with leftism is a step toward that evil and the construction of the total state. Anything you wish the state to provide for you is a concession, a submission of some form, the erosion of some aspect of your individual freedom via your money or your liberty and it will keep pushing you to keep making concessions to its will, because this is how the state increases its power, and it will use any and all excuses to keep doing so. Because if you allow the government to break the law because of an emergency, they will always create an emergency to break the law. Given this fact, any reform of this apparatus is futile. Combating it necessitates destruction and destruction only. So fundamentally, what is the problem with the state? That. It's existence. Very appropriate. So with that being said, I want to debunk something else here, which is the myth of the middle, the moderate, the enlightened centrist. Anyone who peddles that BS is a deluded imbecile, spineless weasels that don't have the fortitude to take absolutist positions. There is no such thing as a centrist policy. Aiden said this as well. The center is never static. It shifts via the positions of what is deemed left and right. To be pulled away from or moved towards this mythical center is merely the adoption of positions that are deemed either left or right by judgment via the Overton window. See, in the real world, there is no middle. The right is correct and the left is incorrect. The further right you go, the more you move towards anarchy. The further left you go, the more you march towards the totalitarian state. And you can see this with the left in practice. And if anyone thinks this is a radical position and quite arrogant on my part, Ask yourself, radical according to who? And can you think of a single example of any leftist solution that doesn't involve more government? Precisely. The only brief flirtation against this idea was the defund the police movement. Now, if it wasn't the stupidest thing ever uttered by mankind, it would have been quite funny. The only thing libertarians and state minimalists will agree on is the need for defense. And the left thought, no, 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 this is the one area for some reason susceptible to state overreach. Why? Who knows? Regular people can't have guns, but politicians can, for some reason, use taxpayer money to fund private security, while their moronic constituents think that they can stave off criminals via neighborhood watch. That is peak retard right there. But anyway, I want to go through this article from the American Prospect, which is a terrible outlet, by the way. Altercation, how the Democrats' economics changed, already alive via the headline. 
The Democrats' economics have not changed at all. They've been this way for over a hundred years, going back all the way to the original progressive era at the dawn of the last century. I want to thank Eric and The Prospect for giving me some space today to tell you about my new book. It's called The Middle Out, The Rise of Progressive Economics and the Return to Shared Prosperity. Shared prosperity, you say? Who does the sharing, I wonder? That doesn't at all sound like wishful communist thinking now, does it? By the way, that phrase, a return to shared prosperity, keep this phrase in mind because later on, he is going to say something that makes his entire thought process seem grossly contradictory. But I'll skip this garbage. Take the very phrase, the middle out. You've heard Biden use it many times. Economic growth doesn't happen from the top down. Yes, it does. It happens from the middle out and the bottom up. This is a direct refutation of supply-side trickle-down economics. Growth doesn't come from giving the rich more tax cuts. It comes from investing in a strong and growing middle class, which will be financially secure enough to spend money, goosing demand, and producing higher employment and more. The policy implications are clear. Instead of tax cuts for the wealthy, the government needs to invest in the middle class via the kinds of things that were in Build Back Better, subsidized childcare, paid family leave, expanded healthcare, so that people can live better and more secure lives, which in turn promotes growth a lot better than tax cuts for the rich do. Okay, all of that is complete rubbish, top to bottom. I can't think of a more efficient way to showcase your stupidity when talking about economics by citing some BS that Biden of all people said which is not even his words, mind you. That's something written for him and not by an economist either. So we're off to a great start here. And the growth always starts from the top. It's the top who makes the business, allocates the resources and pays the salary. It's hierarchical in structure. Growth doesn't come from giving the rich more tax cuts. It comes from investing in a strong and growing middle class, which will be financially secure enough to spend money, goosing demand and producing higher employment and more. Okay, all of that. It's just a roundabout way of saying, we want to steal your money. Growth absolutely comes from giving the rich more tax cuts because the rich are the ones who will invest their money more wisely because it's their money. They have an incentive to be fiscally responsible because they're looking for a return. And the government does not because it is not their money. Case in point, fossil fuels. Can regular people invest substantially consequential funds into the fossil fuel industry? No, but the wealthy can. And what happens if the government stops being the parasitic middleman and uncuffs the industry? You get an energy boom. Investors make a lot of money. The energy sector spurs employment and people get cheaper energy and everything else becomes cheaper. Why? Because everything runs on energy. And what does the government have to do to get this result? Fuck off. As a matter of fact, that's about the only thing government needs to do to spur growth. Get the fuck out of the way because the government does not produce anything. I never knew that anarchy could be so glorious. You would expect everyone to just be riding in the streets and beating the shit out of one another. But really, everyone's working together and making a ton of money doing it because the government gets nothing. It comes from investing in a strong and growing middle class. This is nothing but a vacuous optimistic soundbite. Investing what? Capital? Which you get from where? The theft of taxation, naturally. So either you are going to rob the rich of their money and poorly allocate the capital, or steal from everybody else when the rich hide all of their money from the government's greedy hands. Judging by the financial insecurity line, the implication is they will take it from the rich and spend their money on behalf of the middle class, implying a certain arrogance that they know what's best for them. But this is, of course, just a sales pitch to appear benevolent, when in reality, they're trying to buy your vote. It's just another gimmick to get you to rely more and more on the state. The policy implications are clear. Yes, they are. You're a Weasley snake oil salesman. Instead of tax cuts for the wealthy, the government needs to invest in the middle class via the kinds of things that were in Build Back Better. (laughs) That answers our question. Subsidized childcare, paid family leave, expanded healthcare. Government, government, and yet more government. See, everything is just an excuse to keep expanding the size and reach of the state. So people can live better and more secure lives by being more reliant on the state for employment, child and health care, which in turn promotes growth a lot better than tax cuts for the rich do. Says who? And by what metric? This point is merely asserted as if it's gospel. If the state provides a service via taxation, you can't opt out of it, nor is there any incentive for them to be fiscally responsible, because again, it is not their money, it's yours. This kind of shit you can only get away with if your audience is loaded with ignorant morons because anyone who has even the slightest grasp of economic reality will see through the swill as a childlike fairy tale understanding of it. 
Well, Biden didn't coin the phrase. I didn't coin it. It was coined by Nick Hanawa and Eric Liu back in 2011. Now, if the former name seems somewhat familiar to you, I did a video on this bloke several months ago because he did a TED talk that never aired because he was lying through his teeth being the bullshitting f that he is. I'll give an example of what a snake this piece of shit is. He was well known for being an advocate of the $15 minimum wage. However, when someone called him on this, asking him, does he pay this wage to his own workers? No, he pays less than half. He pays $7.25. Like all progressives, a typical unprincipled son of a bitch. Even when the economy today is good, it's not really good. That is, even when unemployment is low and the market is doing well and so on, the fact is, a fact mostly unremarked in the daily media, we are still in the midst of an economy whose main feature is that millions of dollars every year are being transferred from the poor and the middle class to the top. So even when the working class, the 50th percentile say, is doing better, the super rich, the 1% and even the 0.1% are doing way better. Who cares? If everyone is doing better, who the hell is the state to try and screw at this? It's logical that people who deal with larger sums of money are going to be better off, especially if the vast majority are doing well and they are spending their income on goods and services provided by the few. That's basic math. I said this before, no one cares if the rich are doing incredibly well as long as they themselves are also doing well. Hey, look, the rich are making so much money. I know, so am I. Look at my wallet. It's great. Woo! No money is being transferred from the poor to the rich through the market. That is a straight up lie. The only time that happens is through government taxation or heaven forbid, a bailout. Economics has finally recognized the existence of politics. For decades or centuries even, economics gave no thought to politics. Wages, for example, were determined by a set of market forces and politics had nothing to do with it. That's how academics thought, but that's not how the world works. Okay, there is so much wrong to unpack in this tiny paragraph, my word. This easily ranks up there with some of the stupidest things I have ever read. Not how the world works. What an absurd thing to say. The implication here being that prior to this arbitrary point of recognition of economics and politics, all prior economic theory and any academic specialist thereof is somehow invalid and now obsolete. Based on what and according to who? Which one person came up with this rubbish and are now suddenly some godlike messiah of understanding in the world of political economics? You have to be completely insane to suggest that prior to this point, no one had any valid economic theories for how markets operate. How did they become academics in the first place then? What kind of imbecile would dare have the brass balls of stupid to suggest that in the absence of politics, markets would cease to operate? You know, that's more damning of your worldview than the old academics. Also tells you the old world was much better because it did not mix economics and politics. The previous academics were much wiser. See, this is why I said keep in mind the phrase from the start, return to shared prosperity, while also rejecting the old academic view. So my question for you then is at what point in time did economics need to finally acknowledge the existence of this politics phenomenon and what did it do then to render the old wisdom of market forces obsolete exactly and why? I realize this question is far too sophisticated for this BS, but I'm curious nevertheless. In the world, workers make what they have the political power to make. That seems obvious to you and me, speak for yourself, peasant. But economists were, and many still are, deeply resistant to acknowledging this. I wonder why. The book tells the story of how this change came about, through the work of people like Joseph Stiglitz and groups like the Economic Policy Institute. It's a really important change because it rejects the assumption of classical economics that left alone, the market will find equilibrium. No, the state has to play an evening out role. See, right there, what I tell you, yet another excuse for more government intervention. That is all they have. The market can't find equilibrium without the state. What does that even mean? What must the state do and why? What's the justification for this? And what will the end result be? Do you have any evidence for this position? No, this is just mindless word salad. Economics has changed profoundly in the century. In some, much of economics has moved from being based on theoretical modeling to being based on empirical data. And as this change has happened, economics has moved left. Not because economists are leftists, <laughs> but because the empirical data showed, for example, that R is greater than G in Thomas Piketty's famous formulation. <laughs> Bullshit. Whatever the hell you're smoking, it's giving you short-term memory loss. In the previous paragraph, you said this was due to the recognition of politics. 
This would lead me to conclude your so-called empirical data, such as it is, is going to be slanted in favor of your political motivations. That is, the data show that the system is rigged for the rich in a way theoretical modeling did not. And there it is, they prove my point. And by the way, this rigging is because of democracy. If you have a system where the rich can openly buy politicians, think speaking fees or campaign donations, it is common bloody sense then that the politicians will do the bidding of their funders. The way to combat this then is not to increase the size of the damn state. All that means is there is more state power for the wealthy to buy off you stupid bastards. There are still, of course, plenty of conservative economists, but a younger and more diverse generation, i.e. a group of idiots, of economists is changing the profession, and those changes are seeping their way into politics by advocating yet more government intervention. Finally, here's how the Democrats should explain all this to people. Idiots doing idiot things because they're idiots. <laughs> It'll amount to that. Republicans and the right are not, of course, just going to lie down and stop arguing economics. We're in for a long battle. I think the best way for the Democrats to win it is this. We need to attach their economic ideas to the ideals that Americans are taught to cherish from an early age. Democracy and freedom. <laughs> you are not going to beat the right by doing that. Funny, and here I was thinking that those apparently adhering to the science and pedal data, such as it is, might think that is enough to persuade people. Unless you think your voters are either too stupid to understand or will ask questions for which you are ill-prepared because you're idiots who don't know the answer. Or you are liars walking a tightrope and will say and do whatever the hell you need to do to attain more power. They should say something like, yes, our economic policies will put more money in your pocket. <laughs> so lying it is then. But they will do more. No, it won't. They are good for democracy because, as the founders knew, a healthy democracy depends on a strong middle class. Which one said that? Too much economic and political power in the hands of the rich leads to oligarchy, and that's where we are headed if the trend of the last few decades isn't arrested. The nonstop focus on billionaire donors creates real problems for our democracy. And Look at this. Uh, President Obama's 69 fundraisers. President Bush only had uh, 41, and President Clinton in the same time period only had 23. Anyway, moving along. In addition, our economic plans will advance freedom. No, it won't, nor have you in any way explained as to how. The right has sold people one definition of freedom. The free market means freedom. Because it does. Well, there are a lot of small towns across this country where people are free to work at the dollar store or to sell a little oxy. That's not freedom. Uh, technically speaking, it actually is. There's another definition of freedom. Making people free to live up to their fullest potential. More bullshit platitudes. If I didn't know any better, I would swear this author has political aspirations, because all of their words sound like empty campaign slogans. That's a kind of freedom that dates to Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms and the definition of rights advanced in his 1944 State of the Union. It even goes back to some founders, as Joseph Fishkin and William E. Forbath show in an important recent book. Speaking of important books in FDR, how about you read a short book called Great Myths of the Great Depression by Lawrence Reed, which features a short rundown of how FDR turned the government into a borderline dictatorship and how his interventionist arrogance prolonged the Great Depression by a full damn decade. As a matter of fact, let's look at a quote by his own Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr. We have tried spending money. We are spending more money than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. I want to see this country prosperous. I want to see people get a job. I want to see people get enough to eat. We have never made good on our promises. I say after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started and an enormous debt to boot. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. When that single mom who works at the dollar store can go to free community college and has a safe and affordable place to park her toddler while she takes those night classes, she is doing exactly that, fulfilling her potential and, in addition, contributing more to the economy. That's freedom too. Yes, 
It's freedom to become an irresponsible single mother, deprive the child of a father, and then rely on the state for your housing, education, and childcare. Oh yeah, that's real freedom to fulfill your potential, whatever the fuck that means. I think the Democrats need to say that, especially after the Dobbs decision, oh for God's sakes, not this crap, when the right has taken away a half a century old freedom from women, the door is open to repossess that word and radically redefine it. And there it is, that last sentence sums up their entire worldview. They want to make freedom to mean your complete and total submission to the state. Long-standing neoliberal economic assumptions are finally being successfully challenged. No it isn't. Only those stupid enough to challenge theories of economics with this surface level of bullshittery is the mentally challenged. If we can save our democracy, there's that slogan again, in these next couple of years, we can win this fight. <laughs> no you won't, because you have zero connection to any aspect of economic reality, pal. And I think we're more likely to win it when we make people understand that economics, democracy and freedom are not separate things. <laughs> oh really? Explain China, which got infinitely wealthier after the death of Mao and certain restrictions were lifted. Is that because of politics or the free market? Dumbass. Is it not ridiculous, their worldview, that the free market, the concept of being able to spend your own money earned from your own labor, is not an adequate definition of freedom, but democracy, the voting of an oligarchical pre-bought candidate, somehow is, even though this apparatus causes the free market to not function properly? Hmm. Free market or democracy? Hmm. So at the end of all of this, what do we learn about economics? Nothing. Not a single damn thing. And that is all for today, and I will see you all next time.